नमस्ते सो टुडे इन द सीरीज ऑफ सनातन धर्म वी शेल टॉक ए लिटिल बिट अबाउट द रिलेशन्स बिटवीन मैन एंड गॉड और शेलवी से रिलेशन बिटवीन द ह्यूमन सोल एंड द डिवाइन सो इन सनातन धर्म दे आर शोन एज इटर्नल कंपेनियंस सी अनलाइक द सेमेटिक रिलीजन वेयर मैन इज ए फॉलन क्रीचर एंड गॉड इज अप अब अब ऑन क्लाउड टेन so what is the relation of fear and supplication you are always afraid you are praying why because i am a fallen creature please lift me up so then to lift you up god sends a priest who throws some sprinkle some water onto you and says now i am changing your name from janardan to john arjan hari to hari now you are yeah now you are saved same thing in islam no this how it operates in india we don't have this in sanatan dharma this is not the way god fearing is replaced by god loving now fear is the most primitive relation that we can form with god it is when our consciousness is very crude then it forms this kind of relation where you are constantly living with the idea of sin mistake this that all those should be to say something very interesting in one of his aphorism he says that you know when the human soul develops it discards fear in that but if you keep a little bit of it it adds to the perfection of the relationship so what is what happens to the fear element what happens to the fear element it is transformed so initially when we are primitive and crude we are afraid of god's wrath he will drive me out of paradise so that's why in india you don't have to fear because india is still not a paradise outwardly <laughs> we live in inner paradise <laughs> so it's okay if he drives <laughs> out <laughs> we will wherever we go we will make a paradise <laughs> ye bhi hota hai na you see wherever indians have gone they have turned it into they have contributed very beautifully whereas wherever whenever we at the like kashmir it was a paradise which has been turned into hell so this is the difference <laughs> between but anyways coming back to that whole thing so the primitive form of fear is god will drive me out of paradise he'll punish me i'll face the fires of hell but the only thing that a god lover fears there is something he fears and that fear is loss of my contact with the divine he loves the lord and he cannot afford to lose his company even for a moment so anything that comes and veils the presence this he cannot bardasht karo he cannot bear it sorry for the <laughs> english english you see like fear attacks the charm so he cannot take it because he has tasted that joy if you have not tasted the joy one cannot understand what it means i remember once someone was saying that one went uh, person all the time telling lies this that so one day he went to the mother and he was telling all lies so he says mother mother knew she would tell later on you know he is coming and telling me lies as if i don't know she so said number of times you'll find conversation so mother listened and then she just turned her eyes away if you just remember that gesture of mother what it means for the divine to just turn the eyes away what an impact it means so that's why in all yogic disciplines we have to keep reorienting anything in life many things will come keep reorienting make sure that it doesn't become a veil between you and your eternal beloved and lover because if that happens then it's like nothing no there is no permanent damage but it's what the divine lover fears but then as he has said that india gave the god lover so what are the forms in which human soul can relate with god as part of god love now these days we have somehow you know because it's uh, it has a profound truth in it but it has become 
mixed up is that the only relation possible is of guru and disciple. And there's so much talk every, what is a guru, what is this, what is that, and it's all about guru and disciple. Sri says that guru is one form of relationship that one can have with the divine. And he goes on to say in the supramental yoga, it is not the only one. Mother goes on to say, oh, you want me to be a guru? You are bringing me down. You expect me. What does the guru do? He will give you some instructions which you have to follow. Now, if you don't follow the instruction, too bad. Sometimes there is another kind of guru who will, Sri Ramakrishna used to say very beautifully, there is one kind of guru who will give you instruction. Then you follow, perish or whatever. That is the Maheshwari. You know, she leaves us free to go our way, whether to prosper or perish. But he would say there is another kind of guru. Actually, because he was a bhakta of Kali. What is that guru? He says he will take the medicine. If you are not willing to drink it, he will pin you down, sit on your chest, close your nose, open your mouth and put the medicine. <laughs> Forcibly make you drink the revitalizing nectar of bhakti. This is the second type of guru. From the, all the four aspects, we can derive this. This is third type of guru, like Mahalakshmi. He will pour the love. The first type, Maheshwari, Jnana. But above. Traditional guru is like that, true guru. And you are approaching him, if you follow, fine. Otherwise, he is equal, impartial, eternal witness. <laughs> then the third type is like Mahalakshmi. She will pour the love by charm and sweetness. And bind you to her. But if she finds that she is surrounded in the heart by malice, ill will, treachery, jealousy, all those things, all related to the divine, then she steps back. But waits, she never abandons you, waits for the poison stuff to be out from the human consciousness so that once again she can come. And the fourth type of guru or the fourth aspect of the guru is Mahasaraswati. A friend in our need, a patient and tranquil counsellor and mentor, a friend in all our difficulties. Very patiently, she will pick up one part and work every little aspect of the disciple. So there are, guru itself is a big word. So gurus can come representing any of these aspects of the divine. They are aspects of the Divine Mother, but Gurus bring something of that. They will ultimately, all Gurus will derive something from the Divine Consciousness, which is the Divine Mother. And they will work upon the disciple. But traditionally, we think of Guru as somebody sitting on a machan with a lot of mala and disciple is below. He has to surrender and normally by surrender is meant give money to the Guru. And he will give you some Guru Mantra and you follow it. Now it's between you and but what does a guru actually do? A true guru? A true guru connects you to the divine. This is the work of the guru. He doesn't have to even say that I am guru. But he connects your soul to the divine. That's it. And if he has done it, the rest will happen automatically. Why it is not connected? Right now the soul is so badly enmeshed in nature, ignorance, that it doesn't even know that there is anything like the divine. But the moment the connection is made, then slowly that inpouring starts and one keeps looking back, upward. This connection is something which is unbreakable bond, original. So this is one action of the Guru. If the psychic being is developed, it will do the same thing. What it will do? It will enter into nature but connect with the divine. So mother says that in a developed psychic being, you don't need an outer Guru. Simply because the psychic being is developed, it will do the same part. Because ultimately, what is the Guru doing? He is linking you to the light. It's not about Ubudesh. A Guru may give nothing, no Ubudesh. He may just quietly sit. You may be just in his company and yet you are evolving. So people often think that suddenly to Arjuna, there is a great disclosure of Sri Krishna on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. But it is not that moment. There is a history behind that moment. Arjuna made a choice. I want you. And every time, whatever Sri Krishna would tell him, he would follow that. He was like his friend. And that is how a bond was developed which eventually led to the grand culmination of the great vision on the battlefield of Kurukshetra. So it is 
Guru and disciple is one of the aspects, especially when the master or the divine comes in the form of a teacher. Then you have that relation. There is a difference between teacher, student and a guru, disciple. We must understand because teacher is somebody who gives you the light, the guidance. Teacher is like the star. So he, he is like a shining light and points the path. That's how in certain Buddhist philosophies or Jiddu Krishnamurti would say that, you know, he has done, he has, and there are stories like that, that he, he has pointed the way. So look at the way but don't see the finger. So this is how people narrate. But that's only one and the most inferior kind of master. There is a greater master. He doesn't only show the way. He says, come, I'll walk with you. So what does he do? He lets you see the way, enjoy the way. Oh, this is nice. Oh, this is danger. Sometimes he will just quietly nudge you. Shubhendu describes that in Asses on the Gita, the relation of the divine and the uh, human soul is beautifully narrated in the story of Sri Krishna's relation with the Pandavas. So wherever the action follows the natural course of the ego, he allows it to carry on. But whenever there is a moment of crisis, his intervention is felt. That's how Sri would many times do. When somebody asks, why are you giving such a long rope to your disciples? He said, you can't create supermen without that. You can't put them under a, you know, patta with a short lease and... You can't because human nature, you have to go through countless things. So, but, there is a patta. The guru holds the key. When he sees that you are going to jump into the abyss, he pulls you. Mother has given examples. Amal Kiran, that one. He says, you are repeatedly going out of my protection. I have to save you. A number of disciples, it has happened like that. That even they have turned away and yet her protection has followed. So this is another kind of guru who walks with you on the path. Doesn't mean that he will constantly give you updesh and tell you do's and don'ts. Gurus, true gurus never do that. That is religion, that is priesthood. Gurus will let you explore and grow through your own nature. But wherever, because the guru knows, that's why the difference between guru and disciple. Some people say, I don't need a guru, I'll find out. Okay, find out, figure out. Learn that biting of a snake can kill you. By the time you have discovered the lesson, you are gone. Learn that if I jump into fire, it will burn me. Fair enough. But it's your life. Nobody stops anyone from finding out oneself. But when the guru is there, when you are going to jump into the fire, what he will do? He will first caution you. <laughs> then next what he will do? He will say, no, no, he really is very keen about, you know, this fire. So he will make you touch the fire and feel the impulse. Still you are keen, no, I want to do Atmada in the fire. So he will change the niyam of Srishti. You see what Arjuna was going to do and he tells, why are you doing all this? He will change the niyams of Srishti like Prahlad and Holika. And you will go through the fire and you will be untouched. This too the Guru can do. This is the Guru. Guru is not just somebody who gives instruction. This word is used so casually. I find it so strange. Sometimes on Guru Purnima day, people start wishing. Sometimes they send to me also. I am not, this is not Guru. Guru is something very profound. Guru takes the burden of your karma onto himself. That's why you know this tradition, touching feet. Touching feet is a very serious business. If you touch somebody's feet, whether you like it or not, your power goes into him and you take in, in return, the whole baggage of karmas. Be careful whose feet you touch and as far as you are concerned, don't allow anybody to touch your feet unless you are ready to do this. So this is the or if somebody still insists, what do you do? You can't get into a fight. So just pray and be one with the Divine Mother. I have seen this with Champaklalji. He would not allow anybody to touch his feet. But there were moments when he would. He allowed me when I, you know, visiting him. I don't know what happened. I had also decided I will not touch anybody's feet except Mother and Shirobindo. <laughs> so I had stopped touching everybody. Parents, parents. People used to say he has become this, that. I said, okay, whatever you believe, I can't. I don't feel like my sister, brother-in-law, nobody. Stopped everybody, touching everybody's feet. Only Mother and Shubindo. But when I saw Champaklalji, automatically I, I didn't even have to think. And I 
just touched his feet. And Champak Lalji never said no. He was disallowing everybody. He stood. And then he touched with his finger the head. And what an experience. And then, of course, I got up and, you know, gave the flowers. And then, so you can be in that state. Nalnida, you know, we know that story. I have shared this. So this, the way it has become like a business where people are thronging at the feet. This is not true Guru. Gurus are like that. They have tremendous power. And they, you can't become a Guru even if you are a Yogi. One may be a Yogi and need not be a Guru. For Guru, you have to have the mandate. You see, when somebody asks Sri about Sri Ramakrishna, so he says, but uh, he doesn't have the mandate to be a Guru. He's a great Yogi. Nobody can deny it. Guru is somebody who is a delegate from the Divine. This is your work. You may be a Yogi, but you may not be given this work. So this idea that everybody who is a great person or a Yogi can become a Guru, if somebody has the mandate, it's okay. But we don't know who has the mandate over. But it is also true on the other hand that if you think of a human being as a guru and start relating as a guru, whatever peril may come to the, that human being if he start believing himself to be a guru, but that's a different story. But if you believe that he is your master, you will find the divine response. This also Sri says. He says the response will come because the divine knows himself in the heart of the creature. Why? Because divine is in everybody. Even you pick up a stone and start saying this is my lord and you worship, you will get the response. There are stories like that also and they are true stories. Shobindo says that you may have a much inferior person, even inferior to you in capacity. And he gives his own example. He says... When I went to Lili Maharaj, he was much inferior than me in spiritual capacity, in intellectual capacity, in every kind of capacity. And he says that he showed me, pointed something and I had an experience. He also didn't uh, understand ki what has happened. Because he didn't know that this will lead to the realization of the immanent divine within people. Know about that part that he entered into nirvanic silence. This one part. But see what happened after that. He asked him. When he asked for instruction, he says, can you obey him in the heart? He said, yes. Okay, you don't need, you just do him pranam and do pranam to him all over, then he will guide you. And later on when he came to meet Sri he did not understand what he was going through. He asked Sri only one thing, are you doing your meditation regularly? Sri just smiled and said no. So what has come to you? But he kept quiet. He said he couldn't understand that I was constantly living in a state of union with the divine. So you may have a much inferior guru, even Kabir Dasji. You know, he was, his guru was Dharam Das, much inferior. Dharam Das was it, he used to worship Murti Puja, he sab karte the. Kabir Dasji ko to unse naam chahiye tha. Mil gaya unko Ram naam kaise mila tha. We all know the story. But then after that, he realized the greatest truth and then once he goes to Dharamdas and when he sees that Dharamdas is praying to idols he's picked up and started throwing them out so he was an iconoclast that how long will you be stuck to this outer thing realize the inner truth so this is uh, so there are many kinds of gurus and we must understand the difference between them not anybody who wears a kind of dress becomes a guru. Guru has nothing to do with the dress you are wearing. Mother has played tennis and everything and she is gurus of gurus and beyond the gurus. So it's not about dress, base bhusa, telling a mantra, giving a diksha, all this we must understand. And in a new age all this has changed. It is something new, something different and above all most importantly, the guru is a representative of the divine who is within our hearts. Ultimately, the guru connects us to that. So he is a representative of the divine. The last thing that he says about Guru, Sri says that all true Gurus are the same because they come from the same source. But it does not mean that a disciple should leave one Guru for another because they are same. See, this is how the human mind operates. The next step should be since God is in everyone, everybody is my Guru. That also recently WhatsApp circulate kar rata. I have many Gurus, this person taught me something. Please, the word has, it's not about the word meaning. It's about the inner sense of the word. Everybody cannot be your guru. 
Yes, if you are Dattatre, you can say, I have learned from the crooning of a bee, I have learned from a harlot, I have learned from 24, learned from a river. Yes, you can reach that state where the universal master discloses yourself, himself to you. That's a different, but we cannot fool ourselves. Even when you reach that state, you still have reverence for the one who has shown you that path. That's why Guru Gobind Dau Khade, Kaku Lagu Pao, Balihari Guru Aapki Jin Gobind Diyo Batai. So why this? It is because when Sri was again asked that, why is it that surrender to the Guru is considered as the surrender of surrenders? He says, because surrender we do to the Divine, Divine is inside. So now I have found the Divine. So what is the utility of the Guru? First of all, it's such a crude mentality that Guru's usefulness is over. I mean, I have found this so crude. It's like a mercenary. As if the Divine will be very happy. Yes, yes, his job is over. Now, you know, you come to me. Divine, he has come to him in that form. Second, more importantly, but this is not what Sri says. This is my own feeling. But Sri says, the surrender to the Guru is considered as the surrender of surrenders because in that, even your outer being and the body participates. How do you say, bow down to the divine within? You will end up putting your own picture and bowing down before it. I have seen people do this silly thing also. But when there is the Guru there outside in his own and you bow down, then your body is participating. It is having the joy of the surrender. Every cell you can, how should Bindu said when mother came and spontaneously she did pranam. She had never known this. And she say, he says that she gave everything of hers right down to the cells of the body that all this is yours. So this you can do only when there is that physical embodiment and uh, you, your body participates in the gesture. So all these things about the Guru. Second, as I said, changing Gurus is never a good thing. It's a, in fact, it's a bad idea because there are different directions in which Guru takes you. God is one, but He is infinite. You may discover the divine as the impersonal. You may discover the divine as the immanent divine inside. You may di discover the divine as one who is beyond the world. You may discover the divine who is in the whole creation. You may discover the anandame aspect of the divine. You may discover knowledge aspect of the divine. He may come to us as the eternal lover. He may come to us as the mighty power. Mahisasur Mardini. So many ways the Guru can come and each master generally represents one aspect. So imagine there is a guru who is teaching otherworldliness and you mix it with Sri and Sri Krishna who are teaching this worldliness and yoga here. Not just this worldliness but as a Jeevan Mukta, this and that. Sri Sri Krishna, the great, some of the great Upanishads, they have taught this. So they are in line with this evolutionary process. But gurus which are taking you on the line of Shiva, Nirvana, Moksha, how can one say that, you know, I'll follow Buddhism and little bit of Sri technique and believe that I am on the path. One may be intellectual, but one is far from the path. Path is path. It is not thinking about the path. It is not reading books about the path. It is not discussions about the path. Path is walking in real time. So the image is that when you are standing, and there are many roads, Alright, you study, each road is offering you a book, read it, decide, one day you will start walking. Can you walk on ten paths? You can read about ten paths, read as much as one wants before taking a decision. But once you have taken a decision, it's finished. Can't go few steps here and little bit here and no. In fact, that's why it's even... Contrary influences, stay away from people who are on to different because it causes pulls. There are influences acting upon us, human beings influences, we were talking about it. Imagine the influence of gurus. It's a very strong, powerful influence. So to think that I can be in anybody's company, he's also a guru, saintly person, he's a good, good uh, master, saint, hai, he will only do good to me. This is complete ignorance. It's... Typical rational mind cannot understand the way occult forces and spiritual consciousness acts. Oh, he is a great person. He is also a saint. He will only bless me. He will do good to me. He may do good to you, but change your path completely. Are you ready for that? You know, Swami Vivekananda, once he 
asked one of the disciples of Sri Ramakrishna. He said, you know, Narendra, you see, Sri Ramakrishna says you are so good. Why don't you teach me meditation? So even Sri disciples, when they start becoming guru, teaching meditation methods, stay away. You have, you can, we can inspire, awaken and share things. But we cannot become, have that place. So Swami Vivekananda said, okay, come, young Swami Vivekananda. Anyways, he always remained young. He said, okay, you sit and meditate. I will also meditate. I will put my hand over your leg, thighs or some place of the body. Now he meditated. He had some experience, wonderful experience. So normally we have, oh, you know, I got a quick experience. He is a devotee or disciple of Sri But see, I got an instant experience. So he also got an instant experience. Wonderful. So next day he goes to see Ramakrishna, very beaming. And Sri Ramakrishna is waiting. And then he tells, where is Narendra? So he comes, Swami Vivekananda, oh, I have done a good job. Why did you do this? What? What did I do? Why did you do this? What did I do? You changed his path. He was not meant to take that journey. He is a bhakta. You put him on the road of jnana. He was going through a shortcut. You have put him on a long road which he cannot sustain. Now he, you have opened him like that. But can he sustain that journey? That was the lesson of Swami Vivekananda. That's why you will see that all through Swami Vivekananda's talks. One place, Sister Nivedita who was close with him, he said, why don't you, you know, they want some instruction. Why don't you instruct them? Give some mantra or teach them a method, a practice. He said, no, this is not my task. My task is to awaken and inspire not to instruct because he had realized then ki, that's enough then the soul and divine journey so there are many dimensions of just the relationship of guru but relationship with, of a guru and disciple is only one relation that we can have with the divine there are many other relations not only as a disciple we can be his slave and he is the master it's a very intimate relation because guru and disciple, you, you meet in the study room. Slave, he will, even when disciple, divine is, master is going outside the study room, he will tell the slave, come with me. Why? Because wherever he goes, he has to carry the slave. <laughs> what are the wages? Delight, not just jnana, but where jnana ends. Jnana ends in delight. That's what ultimately knowledge and oneness is meant to give you, the delight. Which is the origin? All knowledge ends up in that. Wisdom is the prelude to delight. But then you discover the ultimate aha. It's delight. So, um, you know, he will take you along. But there is a still deeper relation. And that is the relation of divine with the beloved. So when the divine goes to rest, he will keep the slave is outside or he may even be inside. But beloved is on his bed. There he will sit and disclose his dreams. You know what I am going to do next? <laughs> Slave doesn't have the privy. He's there. He may strain his ears, listen a little bit, but to the beloved he discloses everything. But there are other relations also. Shurinda speaks of that. He can become a friend. Look at Sri Krishna and how Brahmaji got deluded. He thinks that what is this Krishna? They are all going and go up and gopi. They are only you know playing around, fooling around with him. He is also encouraging. They don't know he is God. How can God be friend? So he goes one day and all the, we have talked about this story, so I will not elaborate it in Sanatana Dharma only. Everybody vanishes, so Krishna manifests. So who is a friend? When the divine gives your friendship, who is a friend? A friend is somebody who is always with you in any moment of crisis. 24-7 friend. But he will let you otherwise lead your own life. Friends don't say, what are you doing, not doing. It's your business. But always he's there. 2 a.m. friend, 3 a.m. friend, 4 a.m. friend, 1 a.m. friend, midnight friend. <laughs> Hello, I'm in trouble. Okay, fine. Friend will come. Friend will respond. But teacher, you will hesitate. <laughs> Guruji ko rahat ko. <laughs> Guruji ko kaise utha sakte hai? Patani Guruji, what you can't even reach him. First, the secretary will pick up the phone. 
So you talk to the secretary that, you know, I need to talk to Guruji urgently. No, whatever it is, you meet tomorrow. No, I am in distress. No, you do meditation, he has given you the mantra, you do. But friend, Are, I am his friend. In fact, he would have already told the secretary, these are on my hotline. Free access anytime. This is friend. But friend will not, there is a limit to friendship. Friendship has the sweetness, but not the intense rapture of union. Then not only friend, he can become your playmate. Mischief. Look how Sri Krishna and Arjuna do mischief. He will do mischief with you. You know that story of Amrita and Shurabindu. Amrita falls in love and wants to, you know, goes to seashore to meet. 4 a.m. friend. And Shurabindu telling him, I think it's your time. So he takes it as a sanction, goes. Everything decided. He even asked him, have you kissed? There is a reason behind it. It's profound. It's not a joke. The reason is, he knew what is there in Amrita. He said, Bhakta, this must come out. You see, when Arjuna is on the battlefield and we all know his crisis, what does he have been the put? He says, it is Sri Krishna who had put his Vaishnavi Maya on Arjuna so that his, all his affections, attachment, tenderness comes out. So he knows. And when everything, then he says, Sir, I will get married. Who? What nonsense? <laughs> Sir, why did you allow me to go so far? To see how far you can go. This is playmate. Playmates in the Leela of the Lord. Mother says at one place, I cannot disappoint, you know, Pavitra, Nalini, Amrita. I have promised them. I have waited. They have waited for this moment in lives. She is not talking of this life. How she will play games when she will come out throwing toffees and Amrita trying to clumsily catch and what sweet relation, you see, of playmates in the game. Mother is, that's why, you know, people don't understand, they think of her like a guru, sitting and Amrita is entering and says, Amrit, how much is the distance between divine and man? He walks 15 steps, stands in front of mother and says, Mother, 15 steps. Because he knows you are the divine. This is what many people didn't understand. So, she had to make a little play to make people understand. He knew that she is the divine. He says, why should I do all this inside and going within when you are right there in front of So he knew the secret of embodied divine. So playmate in the Leela of the Lord is a big thing. Then he can become the hero warrior and the leader and you fight under his banner. Didn't he say to Charu Chandra Dutt that it is a relationship that declares through the ages. We have fought the great battle of the ages. He has forgotten, but I know it like the Gita. Arjuna, you don't remember anyways. We are not expected to remember, but I know. How will we understand these things? Dilip Kumar Roy, why he said, I have cherished you like son and a friend. Friend, see? Why did he regard him like that? Imagine, the story may go back to Trojan War and even before when he is Hector, and one gesture, when Shurabindu is Vibhuti is Paris, and Hector, noble man, he says, I am going to face Achilles, but Paris, you stay. He knows it is death. Achilles is a killing machine. <laughs> Nobody can win ever. And yet, Achilles is killed by Paris. That's a different story altogether. He goes, and so, you know, he remembers that, that here is, so these are small little things, which, you know, it's a, not one life. When Sri was asked, what punyas we have done to be here, and he said one of the things, that relationship in previous lives, bhakti in previous lives, we think it's only one life? No. So, there are those who have fought with the divine, the battle of the ages. All of us must have been some monkeys and bhalu, Bandar, why not? We all want to become jnanis, huh? sitting in meditation. I was a yogi. All When you read past life, what were you? Oh, I was a great yogi like this. Are you, what did you do during Rama's time? Probably a monkey. So nice. And he blessed. That blessing continues. So, this is the relation of the playmate. And he does mischief like Narada. He wants to get married. He says, okay. And he changes his face into a monkey. 
and everybody laughs and he says what did you do to me he says yes i you wanted to get married i said okay go but what did you do to my face well, he said that's my trick little trick last shot is always called by me because i love you you are my friend and playmate so it's a great intense relation then he can become the father and the mother so what is the difference between father and mother father is somebody whom you know that in difficulty whom do you contact contact the father all the outer things dad i am stuck in this problem you know there is a police fellow who has caught me or this that i am dad dad i need money dad mother mother is everything even jab dad ko manana hai to mummy <laughs> you want you know in distress you may call he must the father he is the you know ultimate thing but everything your everyday life from smallest details is arranged by the mother and the mother likes it to be so shrivinda says that the divine mother the child soul goes to the divine mother in all her his difficulties and the divine mother pours her heart out indulges and she wants it to be so so that she can pour her out she is so much love inside her she wants those who can come to her and say ma i need this and you know that relation also when somebody in ashram out of instead of porcelain steel thalis had come so somebody went to the mother and said mother so nice now we have steel thalis to eat mother said i want my children to eat in gold bowls she didn't say don't get attached and all because she is divine mother she wants to give us everything inner and outer if we are ready to receive she wants to pour her out indulges that's why of all the relations divine mother relation is considered as among the highest there is only one relation which goes after that but the divine mother in whom shamelessly we go dropping all our clothes we know that she may scold us but she is the one who will put the healing balm also she may scold that relation is there once amal kiran standing casually on the car she gave a slap suddenly what happened mother you know you are on a battlefield and you can afford to be unconscious then he realized that his thoughts were in a you know what kind of state they were you know you are standing on battlefield that was a war going on and the divine mother and shurbindo were in the war every disciple was a little mini battlefield and he recounts it mother can scold mother can even give you a little slap but always she will defend you if ever there is nobody can defend you as a mother would she will give her life to save you she will stand as a shield between you and the enemy and then the enemy may be <laughs> i mean the person standing against you may be god himself this is the story when parvati stands even an asura she says shiva says but he is an asura all the gods come he says but i have told him abedan you can't touch him and the story you must have read no when she swallows shiva shiva says please see swallow shiva she says i won't allow i love my child and asura is doesn't know shiva is standing trembling then um, lord vishnu and she becomes a vidhva that beautiful story she this you know one of the forms of divine mother as a vidhva you see even in real life i can tell you if a mother has to make a choice between husband and child she will choose the child if it comes to that last moment save one she will save the child if she has to choose between herself and child it's obvious she will choose the child so this is the relation of divine mother and the child soul but this relation has to be built from both sides she has built it from her side all possible relations but if we start putting her as a guru or a teacher or you know ignoring even there is a relationship which is of course the worst kind relationship of enmity with the divine a person who resists the divine is more open than somebody who is indifferent by resisting the divine he proves that somewhere deep inside he knows <laughs> once i was telling somebody you know every time he, the person has a problem he will blame the divine but he doesn't believe in divine so one day i had to tell him ki you decide which side are you what do you mean i said are you an atheist 
Yes, I don't believe in divine. But why are you complaining every time to the divine? Why are you saying, look at the world he has made? I said, you decide. You can be an atheist. Every is fine. You can be an even atheist sometimes can be out of a genuine query. But they are indifferent. Who don't? They are only living. They are the worst kind of people who are living only for their little my selfish needs. Even they will go to temples, do this. If you ask them, atheist, atheist, they will say, ah, believe karte hain. Why? Because please everybody. That is worst. But an atheist who has thought about, he is trying to understand the divine, but he cannot. So he says, I don't believe. Then enemy of the divine. Why he made the world like this? So there is also this relationship. So the atheist who regards this world as nihil, divine meets him like nihil. So if divine comes to an atheist who believes that there is nothing, so the divine will come to him as nothingness. So he will say, see how much ever I explore, I find nothing. So if the divine could speak, he, he would speak. And if he could hear, he will say, see you kept telling I am nothing, so I am here as nothing. And he meets as a vast nihil. If you meet him as an enemy, he will say, fine, fair enough. Come, let's fight. Even that will lead to liberation. Because any contact with the divine will eventually free you. And we have so many stories of that kind. But the most intimate relation that one can ever have. But the most difficult, the most rapturous, the most complete is the relationship of the divine as lover and beloved. He is the lover. From his side he has started. And he is such a lover that he will chase you out. Hound of heaven. You try to hide where, anywhere he will pull you. You try to, you know, and he is, he is a lover at one place, Shurabindu says, or um, uh, he is a very jealous lover. He will not let you. <laughs> very possessive. If you forget him, he is going to pull you back. And say, look here, you are mine. Whatever it be, but you are mine. So this kind of relationship of the divine lover and beloved, of course, that is not jealousy. That is the intense love and the rapture that he will not. And the union is also so rapturous. Right to the body, one can feel it. In no other relationship, you can feel this union. Shubhinder describes it in records of yoga where it speaks about spirit and matter and the ananda in the very cells of the body. Because that is a relation, the rapturous love. So we'll read at the end something about that. And there is no end to it. So he describes all the relationship one can have with the divine. He is the master. But in this way of approach, all distance and separation... All awe and fear and mere obedience disappear. Such a master. Not a master means you are trembling. That is not the kind of master. Because, okay, somebody had asked me to give the page number. And, okay, the page number is 366, 377. Oh, sorry, 576 onwards in the synthesis of yoga. And it starts with all the relations by which this union comes about become on this path intensely and blissfully personal. That which in the end contains, takes up or unifies them all is the relation of lover and beloved. Because that is the most intense and blissful of all and carries up all the rest into its heights and yet exceeds them. He is the teacher and guide and leads us to knowledge at every step of the developing inner light and vision. We feel his touch like that of the artist molding our clay of mind. He is not the uh, teacher like, do this, don't do this, I shall punish you. No, he is like an artist. He understands us. This is like tailor-made teaching, <laughs> personalized teaching. So that's why mother says, what I say to X, don't turn it into a dogma. Shobindu also says that. In fact, Mother said, don't show my letters to another person. Because what I am writing to you, I'll, I may write completely opposite thing, different thing to another person. That is the beauty of a personalized relationship with the Divine. But that we have to build. It cannot be done by books. In books, you have a general guidance. You will have something very general. But if you build a personal relationship, He will do it like that. His voice revealing the truth and its word, the thought He gives us, 
to which we respond the flashing of his spears of lightning which chase the darkness of our ignorance then he is the master but the distance disappears we become too close and united with him for these things to endure and it is the lover of a being who takes it up and occupies and uses and does with it whatever he wills obedience is the sign of the servant but that is the lowest stage of this relation dasya so with the master you have to obey so you are a servant but he says that is the lowest afterwards we do not obey but move to his will as the string replies to the finger of the musician obedience is still a distance oh you have said i i wanted to do something else but i lobe but time comes when you are an instrument he moves you and you move it doesn't matter you don't question it is not even guidance receiving and then acting there is a dis distance see that distance is gone to be the instrument is this higher stage of self surrender and submission but this is the living and loving instrument and it ends in the whole nature of our being becoming the slave of god rejoicing in his position and its own blissful subjection to the divine grasp and mastery so you willfully gladly ma i am yours just take me that's it if she says once yes finished <laughs> she says whole world cannot keep you away if the divine has said yes you have said i am yours and the divine has said yes but he will try and test he'll actually prepare you because once he says yes then you are like where he will place you what he will make you do you can't imagine he is the friend the advisor helper savior in trouble and distress the defender from enemies he may do whatever he feels like with you but when <laughs> you are faced with an enemy let the whole world stand against you the gods and the demons and he will be by your side once i remember in 2000 as going through very personal you know challenging time not covid challenge only vid challenge vid is root with this knowledge <laughs> so whatever it is <laughs> some kind of a challenge so chutna ran ji i don't know how he came to know i was far away he asked somebody those days mobile mobile kuch nahi he asked somebody to send a personal message to me he said tell him and it was very clear that he is intuitively felt it inspired tell alok that he is a bhakta of the lord and the lord will stand by his side in every battle it was so beautiful to receive it and i i know that you know what i was going through and he stood by me the divine nobody could understand but he stood by me rock solid and i knew that everything will just go so that's how he is the friend who stands by your side fights our battles for us or under who shield we fight we have to we also like love wherever there is a choice between divine and anybody else as i was saying you fight the charioteer the pilot of our ways and here we come at once to a closer intimacy he is the comrade and eternal companion the playmate of the game of living but still there is so far a certain division however pleasant and friendship is too much limited by the appearance of beneficence <laughs> look how he is bridging the gap the lover can wound abandon be wroth with us seem to betray yet our love endures and even grows by these oppositions they increase the joy of reunion and the joy of possession see he is revealing to us even the secret of human relationships all human relationship are a shadowy reflection of that what a friend should be what true love would be what a mother father are so you see what he talks about through them the lover remains the friend and all that he does we find in the end has been done by the lover and helper of our being for our soul's perfection as well as for his joy in us but we don't understand so we very soon give up what is it you have been too cruel with me arjuna never said that even when the kingdom is gone never for a moment he said what krishna people say you are god why did you do this to me never what it complete trust He is the father and mother too of our being, its source and protector, and its indulgent cherisher and giver of our desires. 
indulgent. He likes that we ask him. And he gives. But now again, these relations have to be formed. It's not like automatically anybody goes and manat pura ho gaya. No, it is a yoga in its own right. He is revealing to it under the yoga of divine love. It is not that automatically anybody, okay, now I will ask this and start testing and trying. It doesn't work like that. When he is the father and mother, he will make sure much more than what a human mother and human father can do. It's unimaginable. I am saying this, I have shared this experience with many people. Just I'm, once again, when my mother left her body, 2000, physical mother. So my first impulse was, I told my sister she was there. Just come and be around. I have to go. Where are you going? I have to go to. There was a center. 15 minutes. I went and did pranam at the samadhi. And I am hearing mother's voice here. She is saying, from now on I am your physical mother also. Trust me. I mean my physical mother is very loving she was till the last day. But the divine mother's love. When I got a fridge, I said, why are you giving me? I will never keep anything. Because I will never buy anything. And it's six years. Not a day when fridge is... Not full, over full, I have to say, please. And mother has made uh, instruments <laughs> who forced her mother because obviously they are her instruments and channels. So that's how it happens. Please huh, don't take it as a, any suggestion, but I'm just telling you that you know, suddenly it struck me. But this is how she works. And you look at it like that. Everything comes because she is the mother. So indulges, she indulges. Giver of our desires. He is the child born to our desire. Whom we cherish and rear. Can't afford to, you know, he is a baby. How is the baby? Because he just come to us like fresh. So slowly he will grow and then your relation will also grow. So he is the child. All these things, you, you have to cherish him. Protect him, safeguard him. Imagine you have to protect now the divine. Somebody says, you, you don't need, divine doesn't need anybody to protect. It's a foolish statement. It's about the relationship of bhakti. Of course he needs nothing. He doesn't care about, I mean, he, it doesn't matter what you do or not do. But when we take that, he's like a child. We present ourselves that let the peers, peers, peers my body and mind, but not him. So this is how. And then finally, all these things the lover takes us, takes up. His love in its intimacy and oneness keeps in it the paternal and maternal care and lends itself to our demands upon it. So this is how it goes and the last um, passage so ultimately it changes into lover and beloved. Thus universalized uh, just a couple of lines it's very powerful please read the whole passage because of paucity of time I am not uh, able to read it. Love comes to us in many ways. It may come as an awakening to the beauty of the lover. By the sight of an ideal face, an image of him. By his mysterious hints to us of himself behind the thousand faces of things in the world. Even that is the approach he takes. By a slow or sudden need of the heart. By a vague thirst in the soul. By the sense of someone near us, drawing us or pursuing us with love or of someone blissful and beautiful whom we must discover. We may seek after him passionately and pursue the unseen beloved, but also the lover whom we think not of may pursue us, may even come upon us in the midst of the world and seize on us for his own, whether at first we will or not. He may come like Saul of Tarsius, like you know, Amal Kiran, how he came. My own life, how in the marketplace suddenly, you know, a book is pushing me. He can come like that. Amal Kiran goes to a bookstore and, you know, shoe store. And there is a newspaper in which there is an article on Shurabindo. Critical article. But he says, oh, this can be my guru. How does he see his ideal face? Oh, he is so handsome. So majestic. And then he says, mother, mother, did he say anything about me? <laughs> mother said, yes, he said... He is very handsome. <laughs> As you approach him, so he comes to you. Even he may come to us at first as an enemy with the wrath of love. Why have you been away from me so long? So he may come like that. And our earliest relations with him may be those of battle and struggle. 
where first there is love and attraction, the relations between the divine and the soul may still for long be checkered and misunderstanding with misunderstanding and offense, jealousy and wrath. You are giving more time to somebody. Wrath. Why, didn't you, why don't you keep me near you in your service? You will say, you are near me. This is physically near. You are <laughs> psychically near. Strife and the quarrels of love, hope and despair and the pain of absence and separation. We throw up all the passions of the heart against him till they are purified into a soul ecstasy of bliss and one, oneness. But that too is monotony. It is not possible for the tongue of human speech to tell all the utter unity and all the eternal variety of the ananda of divine love. Our higher and lower members are both flooded with it. The mind and life no less than the soul, even the physical body takes its share of the joy, feels, its t feels the touch, is filled in all its limbs, veins, nerves with the flowing of the wine of the ecstasy, Amrita. Love and Ananda are the last word of being, the secret of secrets, the mystery of mysteries. And finally, toward the end he says, we have the absolute union of the divine with the human spirit. Sayujya. So, the lover of God does not seek mukti, that he clarifies. But for love, complete union is mukti. Liberation has to it no other sense and it includes all kinds of mukti together. For nor are they in the end, as some would have it, merely successive to each other and therefore mutually exclusive. We have the absolute union of the divine with the human spirit, Sayujya. In that reveals itself a content of all that depends here upon difference. But there the difference is only a form of oneness. Ananda too of nearness and contact and mutual presence, Samipya, Salokya, Ananda of mutual reflection, the thing that we call likeness, Sadrash, we grow into the likeness of the divine, we grow into a nearness of the divine and other wonderful things too for which language has as yet no name. <laughs> and this powerful sentence with which he stops one of my most favorites look the power in it but you can't do it this way ki, oh this is it then let me be a bhakta let me give myself as Sivinda says that those who give themselves absolutely to the divine the divine gives himself absolutely to them for them the heights of ananda and everything but he says only you can't do it by this idea that I'll get this because then it's no more giving so this last sentence has to be read with this proviso there is nothing which is beyond the reach of the God lover or denied to him. For he is the favorite of the divine lover and the self of the beloved. Prabal prem ke pale padkar prabhu ko niyam badalte dekha. Apna maan rahe na rahe par bhakt ka maan na talte dekha. People still say Krishna, no? That, oh, he lied, he broke his promise. He said, all I will take. But Arjuna, he is a hero. <laughs> but I will not allow anything to come between Arjuna and the world because I stand there. So there is nothing which is beyond the reach of the God lover or denied to him. <laughs> For he is the favorite of the divine lover and the self of the beloved. <laughs>